they want to maximize attention. We were discussing uh, earlier. Maybe they want to hype stories so they can sell more newspapers the next day or can get the readers to actually go back to their column and read it uh, the following day and the following week. Uh, on the other hand, if I can think about a demand-driven story in which journalists are just catering to what the investors want to read. Uh, in the political realm, there is lots of evidence on this, of so this catering, the fact that uh, you know, people tend to read the same sources all the time to just reinforce their, their priors. This confirmation biases has been fairly well documented in the political economy side. Now, these stories are obviously uh, intertwined. Now, as a social scientist, I do have to have some sort of null hypothesis that I'm going to be testing. Uh, so let's try to set up what is a null hypothesis. And uh, the first question that comes to mind is, what should a journalist do to maximize attention? And John was telling us that maybe we just need to use the word, the T word, and that would actually generate a lot more clicks. That's potentially one of the things that one could do today. I guess in my data set, he's not there, so that won't, won't work very well. Uh, now, if I put my economist hat on, I tend to think about journalists as just providing information. Uh, information that is useful for investors. Somebody sitting there reading the newspaper, the rest of the market column saying, huh, that's interesting, I should rebalance my portfolio as a consequence of what I, I just read. As such, I would probably imagine that these journalists should be really up, jumping up and down when we have big stock price movements. When the market goes up by 5%, 2%, that's probably when you want to do something, not when the market moves up or down by two basis points in which nothing has really happened. Um, if I think about journalists paying attention or trying to generate attention from the readers, it's very likely that if the market goes down by 5%, uh, investors are going to flock to the newspapers to figure out what, what's going on. Now, on the other hand, if the market is flat or is going up, maybe the journalists really want to try to color the newspaper in different ways uh, to actually get the attention from investors. Lots of different stories that one can spin here. Now, I do have to have a, a, an old hypothesis, and I'm gonna say you know, the sentiment in these journal articles is gonna go up if the market goes up, it's gonna go down if the market goes down. Uh, there is some work on informational economics by Matthew Flyder from the 1980s that suggests that this would be, I think, you know, information sellers, that would be uh, a natural null hypothesis. Now, I do want to talk about Schiller's, uh, I'm gonna call it entertainment role hypothesis. If you read his media chapter, it's actually very depressing in terms of uh, thinking of financial journalism. So he's basically criticizing the Gene Kramers of the world that come here and make a lot of noise, but don't really provide any information that is useful. Uh, to investors. And in particular, he emphasizes, Schiller's book came in 2000, so he emphasizes how you picked up the San Francisco Chronicle in 1999. It was all about these huge IPO returns, um, you know, hyping what was going on in, in the stock market, these positive events. Uh, he also talks at length about the fact that this is a job, writing this daily column day in, day out, is a pretty boring job in the sense that, you know, sometimes they just change one word and you have to write a 800-word essay, if you wish. And, uh, you know, they're going to tend to color or to exaggerate these average days in which the stock market is going up or down by 10, 20 basis points. All right, so what is the paper in a nutshell? What I'm going to try to document is look at what drives the content of financial news. Uh, I'm going to mention both Paul and myself have something in our paper about this, but it's completely secondary, so nothing that, uh, you know, there's still a lot to, to be said. Um, I'm gonna be focusing on what happens on the market, given that these columns that we're gonna be reading are general market uh, columns. One can think about including other things, like macroeconomic announcements, etc. cetera. Uh, I don't think that's gonna bias anything that we're gonna see here. And the empirical approach is gonna be a very simple, uh, non-linear fit, so I'm gonna try to predict what happens to media content as a function of what happened to the Dow Jones Industrial Average the previous day, two days ago, three days ago, and so on. And this is the essence of the paper. So I'll describe very quickly what I have in this graph. On the y-axis, I have a measure of sentiment, and I'm gonna measure sentiment by counting positive words, subtracting negative words, and dividing by the total words in these articles. <coughs> These positive and negative words come from psychology dictionaries specialized to finance. I'm going to show you a couple of different dictionaries. It doesn't really matter very much. And what I have on my x-axis 
is the Dow Jones Industrial Average returns. As you mentioned, these are daily returns. The standard deviation of these returns is about one. So I have about six standard deviations here, which is pretty much the whole bulk of the sample. I am uh, censoring all the returns at 3%, so I don't have any outliers like the 1987 crash we would be driving driving results. So I have a couple of different estimators in this graph. I'm gonna focus on the red one and then the black one that you can see in the background. They're basically almost the same one. Synthetically, they would be. Um, what do we see? Well, as the stock market goes up, journalists do seem to be work using more positive words or less negative words, ne less negative words. Now, there is a kink in that the slope in the negative domain is a lot higher than the slope on the positive domain. And as a matter of fact, the slope on the really positive domain is virtually zero. Journalists do not seem to be hyping these positive returns. They seem to be hyping the negative domain. And this is the main, the main result of the paper, and the rest is just gonna be trying to convince you this is there and trying to scratch our heads as to what drives these kinks. Now, probably the best way to uh, to look at this is to say, well, what happens, let's look at different dates. So the black line that you see in the next graph is the, the red line that I have a second ago. So this is the relationship between media content and what happened in the stock market the previous day. This dashed line that I have here is what happened two days ago. The dotted line is what happened three days ago. And the dash and dotted is what happened four, four days ago. And what do we see? We see the positive domain if the stock market went up two, three, four days ago, you can't read it today. It's not gonna show up in today's news, or at least in the sentiment of this news. On the other hand, if the stock market did go down, you know, say 3% two days ago, the journalists are using about a half a standard deviation more negative words than they would otherwise. And if they went down three days ago, same thing, and four days ago, it's still gonna show up in today's news. So I think the evidence is fairly conclusive that at least when it comes to financial journalism, it is the negative domain that is coloring what journalists choose to write about. Uh, and there's almost no action whatsoever on the positive domain. Um, same thing here, if I look at, uh, these are smoother estimates, last trading day, if I go last week, we see a similar story. If I go last month, a similar story, uh, similarly for, for last year. All right, so let me get, uh, I think I've already said this, this in words. Let me get to the details of, of the paper. How do we document this? So I'm gonna grab a bunch of uh, articles from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. A Breast of the Market is a column that got published and interrupted from the 1920s until very recently. It was published every single day uh, of the week. Uh, I'm also gonna use two columns that got published in the New York Times called Financial Markets for about the first 50 years that basically talk about general market news. And then a column called Topics in Wall Street. That is, this one actually changed titles throughout the last century. It was Sidelights from Wall Street, uh, Financial and Business Sidelights. Uh, it's, for those of us who are old enough, is what became Marketplace eventually in the 1980s. General market uh, column. So I'm gonna be aggregating all my articles by trading clock, meaning from the market closes until the market next opens. I should highlight here the New York Stock Exchange was actually open on Saturdays for about half of my sample period. It was in the 1950s that I started closing on Saturday, so I need to be kind of uh, careful about this. And I will mention my media content definition is gonna be a very simple one following um, Paul's leads. I'm gonna take positive and negative words in my articles. Uh, I have to basically do this dictionary approach the way I collect the data. The data comes from this historical archive, so I start with images that convert it to text, and then I actually start, I start reading it. Uh, I'm gonna focus most of my presentation on the Laura and McDonald dictionaries, but I will show you some graphs as well with Harvard 4, which was Paul's original dictionary, and a few variations around it. Positive words in finance, uh, uh, financial journalism, about 1% of the words are positive. About 2% are negative. This is pretty standard in financial studies. By the way, if you look at other texts, these numbers tend to be much higher. So other texts, the political text is a lot more colorful than financial views are. That's just what it is. Uh, that is a fact. Uh, 
Now, the beauty of this is that there is a lot of variation <coughs> when thinking about the standard deviation of content. So there, there are articles that are very positive, articles that are very negative. Uh, given the long time series, that's going to give us a lot of statistical power. Uh, on average, I have about 2,000 words because I have three articles, each about 700 words each. So if I think about one standard deviation, it means 20 different sign words that are positive or negative, which is a, a fair number of words on a daily, daily basis. What are positive words and negative words? Gain, advance, profit, good, improve. You know, the, the, the kind of things that you would imagine are going to show up. These are order by frequency. On the negative side, close. This probably is not a negative word in this context. So this is why it's, it's good to use different dictionaries. It is part of the Lauren and McDonald. We, draws, late, and so on. Now, I do want to point out one new fact, uh, which comes from a natural language processing side. So if you look at log frequencies, and these are for the, the negative words, the same graphs actually shows for the positive words. Uh, in the computer science literature, pretty much any text you look at, this is from Shakespeare to political news, uh, you're going to end up having a straight line. I mean, there, there is this log linear relationship in frequency space. When one looks at these financial columns, we see that there are about 30 or 40 words that just happen very, very often. Uh, these are essentially just engrams that people are repeating all the time. The market closed down today. And they just say that a lot. And that's showing up in, in our data. So something to keep in mind. We are going to be doing what is called TFIDF weights at some point, in which we're going to give less weight to these very frequent words, and more weight to more unusual words. Uh, in hope of actually having a better metrical sentiment, as we will see, none of the conclusions that I showed you a second ago are going to be changing. All right, I'm going to get to the main specification, which is just a regression in which I'm trying to predict media content uh, as a function of what happened in the market the previous day. Uh, I'm going to have a bunch of different controls for what time of the, the month it is, day of the week, and so on. Uh, I'm going to be Estimating piecewise linear functions, so that way I can actually have formal tests by piecewise linear. What I mean is these functions that look exactly like these red lines here, so they have different slopes, and then I can actually do a formal test. If this is slope different than this one, if this is slope different than this one, which sort of will allow me to conclude to what extent there is this kink or this asymmetry in the way things, uh, in the way journalists write. And I just want to give you a sense of the magnitudes. These are the slopes that we find. In, the, in our data. So the one over here is our 0.65, which is higher than the 0.52 that we have here. The ones on the tails is 0.05 for the positive domain, about 0.2 for the negative domain. So this is four times bigger, the, how much they're actually coloring here versus how little they're coloring <coughs> on the positive domain. Uh, we're going to do the same thing when thinking about one day ago, two days ago, three days ago, and four days ago. I just want to give you a sense of the actual magnitude of the coefficients. So the top rows are the negative domain. The bottom rows are the positive domain. Um, I'll just talk about the extremes, which are probably the more interesting. So one day ago, this 0.24, much higher than 0.02 in this particular specification. Uh, if I go two days ago, this is still about 0.2. It's about zero if I look at the positive domain. Uh, it's actually negative three days ago and four days ago. It seems to come down, although it's not statistically significant or barely so, whereas it's still very persistent on the negative domain. And this is essentially the graph that I have showed you early when summarizing the paper. Um, if you do more cuts, you get the same results. I do want to talk about a couple of uh, more nuanced tests. So this is if you do. Uh, TFIDF, so you give these different weights to different words depending on their, current, uh, on their frequency. And as you can see, the fact there's a still a very high slope on the negative domain, there is literally no action whatsoever on the positive uh, domain. If you do Harvard for dictionaries, using regular weights or using TFIDF, you get exactly the same picture. Very steep on the negative domain virtually no action on the positive uh, domain. You do it with regular weights or TFIDF, the conclusion doesn't change. Uh, these are the point estimates, the benefit of time, since I do want to actually have time for questions, to put a couple of different things, let's keep going. 
So this is, if we separate out positive and negative words, most of these dictionaries make a distinction. In Paul's work, for example, he only looks at the negative words to seem to have bigger bite than positive words. And we look at positive uh, words, the graph looks very similar to what we had from before. So it's very steep on the negative domain. Still goes up a little bit when the market is sticking up, and then it basically flattens out completely. What happens with negative words? Well, with negative words, the picture is a little bit more nuanced in the sense that we do see a lot more negative words as the market has done worse, which is what we would expect. But look at the positive domain now. When the market goes up, eventually journalists start using more negative words. I'm actually originally from Spain, so I'm not quite sure these English nuances, where this is coming from, but uh, is there in the data. People are using more negative words when the market is actually uh, going up. Now, I do want to spend some time on the time series variation and other fixed effects results that we have in the paper. Uh, I mean, having 100 years of worth of data is, is a luxury because lots of things have changed uh, over the last 100 years. And in particular, the media landscape has changed a lot. <coughs> One goes to the beginning of my sample period. The New York Times and Wall Street Journal were probably the biggest journals. There was still some local competition, lots of dailies throughout the country, uh, especially here in New York City. Uh, certainly, if I look at the last period, the last part of my sample, you know, there's a lot of competition from cable news, CNBC, CNN. Uh, now we can actually start reading the FT online if you want to. Uh, so when thinking about these differences in the, the supply of news, uh, if the results were driven by supply considerations, I mean that the journalists are reacting to each other and competing with each other and so on, we should see changes through these last 100 years. So what I'm reporting here are the three slope coefficients. So the ones, beta 1 and beta 2 are the ones in the negative domain, beta 3 and beta 4 on the positive domain. So what, what happens if we look at the last 25 years in my sample? We see something very similar to what we have seen before. Okay, the coefficient of the negative domain are always higher than on the positive domain, uh, about twice as high in this particular case. If I go back 25, 25 years, I get numbers are almost identical, 0 0.2, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.1. Okay, so it doesn't seem like this 25 years and these 25 years are very different. Moreover, if I go back you know, into the 1930s now, what do I have? 0 0.2, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, about 0.1, almost identical. If I go back to the beginning of my sample, the numbers come down a little bit, but I can tell you that that's mostly driven from the fact that the scans that I'm getting the data from are a lot more noisy. So I have a lot of more transcription error that actually biases my coefficients down slightly. But by and large, I look at this, the first time I looked at it, I did it this way and then I did it by decades, I was shocked at how stable these relationships actually were. Which seems to suggest, and this is very indirect evidence, but it does seem to suggest that this is not driven by the supply side. We can go further than that actually, because at least for the rest of the market column, we actually have the authors, or the authors start signing their articles starting in the 1970s. Uh, before 1970s, all these newspapers were pretty much like the Economist is now. You don't know who wrote uh, what. So unfortunately, we don't have who wrote the articles before that. But we do have for this 35-year period. We use it in, a, in another paper. So we're going to take the 10 most prolific authors of the rest of the market uh, column. I will make the joke that is Garcia here. Uh, turns out to be Beatriz Garcia, who's still active uh, as a journalist in, in Florida, I believe. Uh, Hillary. Hillary is the guy that has written the most. He wrote mostly in the 1970s, wrote over 2,000 of rest of the market columns. I don't know how you can be you know, regional enough to do this over 2,000 times, but he was. Uh, O'Brien, follow him, he wrote over 1,000. Uh, you can see there's plenty of variation. Once you get into the 1980s, there's a lot more rotations into who writes this column. Before that, there was a guy that would basically do Monday to Thursday, he would get a spare on Fridays, and once in a while, when he was on holidays. All right, so let's get to the, the actual point estimates or you know, the kinks that all these different authors uh, exhibit. In previous research has been shown that everybody has their own slang when we write. Some people write words with more syllabies. Some people write you know, more words per sentence, uh, you know, depending on how you were, I guess, you were taught back 
back in a school or what is your background. Uh, so you would have expected to see quite some variation in the way these, these journalists are writing about the market. So let's look at the, uh, compare the positive and the negative domain in the middle. Okay. So this is the market is moving from 0 to 1%, from minus 1 to 0%. So this will be the negative domain, this will be the positive domain. And if you go through the list, pretty much in every single instance, with two, two exceptions, you see that they're emphasizing the negative domain a lot more than the positive domain. The contract is even more stark once we look at very large movements in the stock uh, on the positive domain versus the negative domain. On the positive domain, actually six of the coefficients are negative, meaning that the stock market is going up and the journalists are losing, using less positive words or more uh, negative words. On the negative domain, on the other hand, all the coefficients, of eight out of 10, are actually positive. One of them is tiny, and the other one is not statistically significant either. So it seems like this asymmetry of how they're treating the positive stock returns and how they're treating uh, negative stock returns is, is very pervasive. Uh, you know, pretty much everybody seems to exhibit this, this preference for delivering news to their clients. You want to look at different indexes. This is using Ken French's index. The results are even uh, stronger. So I guess if I was smart enough, I'd probably put this as the body of the paper, not the other graphs. Uh, if you lose more lags, you get the same uh, sort of results. So oops. Uh, if I wanted to summarize, what we have found is that it doesn't matter how you cut the data. You know, we get the same kinks. Uh, same results if we look at different indexes. And this asymmetry in the domain of gains and losses seems to be there even with fairly long lags. I mean, even if you go back a week or a month, uh, there is the, the returns of the stock market a month ago will show up in the news today if and only if the market went, went down. The market went up, we won't be able to see that persistence. Um, you know, demand versus supply stories, although the data is somewhat indirect, uh, it does seem to be suggestive that the Kims are coming from the demand side, meaning that we have changes in supply, both from the time series and these other fixed effects, and we basically see the same uh, kinks, this real asymmetry in the domain of, of gains and losses. So I've got a couple of minutes. I'm going to give you something that you can discuss with your partner tonight. Uh, <laughs> that's for fun. This is something I can talk to my wife about. She's a medical researcher, so she doesn't know anything about finance or journalism. Uh, so I'm going to look at the weather in Central Park and see how that actually uh, affects financial news, which is kind of crazy, you say, right? I mean, financial news are about finance, not about the weather in Central Park. I'm picking Central Park just because we have a very long time series of weather in Central Park from, uh, from NOAA. Um, and then I'm going to throw in a bunch of stuff. I haven't shown you what happens on Monday versus Thursdays. Uh, so. Uh, by the way, I'm going to be a true scientist here. I'm going to pick pretty much every single weather variable that I could get from Central Park, from cloud cover all the way to temperature and uh, winds. Um, by the way, the literature in economics seems to suggest, or in psychology, that it's cloud cover that actually makes us depressed. Uh, it's not so much the temperature itself. It's the fact that we don't get sunlight. So sunlight good, cloud bad. So what do we see in the content of financial news? Uh, it turns out if it's cloudy, we do see uh, a couple more negative words in financial news. Uh, <laughs> not on the weather report. I'm using the rest of the market column to get these, these estimates. Um, and here for more entertainment value, these are the estimates for the calendar effects. So my meeting variable is Monday. So people are a lot more positive on Tuesday than they were on Monday. <laughs> A lot more positive on Wednesday, even more on Thursday. You know, equally happy on Friday, very happy on Saturdays. And uh, the week after a holiday is even worse than Mondays. So that will be the day after Thanksgiving. All right, that was entertainment value. Conclusion is a very early step in terms of trying to understand how financial journalists react <coughs> to what's going on in the market. I hope to have convinced you that there's this very strong kink the domain of gains and the domain of losses looms very differently for financial journalists. There is lots of work in psychology and behavioral economics about this, so perhaps it's not too surprising looking at it. Although, you know, ex ante, after reading Schiller's book, 
I was really expecting a lot more hyping of positive returns than we actually see in the data. And I would love to hear your thoughts on how to interpret these things. You see demand for this negative news that we just really want to be fed these really bad days. Uh, is it you, the utility of investors or is it just uh, journalists being idiosyncratic in terms of what they report?